welcome everyone to to this webinar. It's organized by EUA and the Fair's Fair project. Uh, I'm my name is Leonard Stoy. I'm a project manager here at EUA, and I'm also involved in the Fair's Fair project. And yeah, welcome to all of those who attend. I can see there are already 147 people in the room, so that's that's quite a big audience that we have today. Um, now. Just to uh, be sure, there's a usual housekeeping notes for the beginning. There is uh, a chat function that you would see on the right and also a Q&A function. So please, um, if you if you don't mind, just start introducing yourself. I see you already started uh, doing that. Uh, if you have questions later on through to the speakers, please um, please use the Q&A tab just to, for us to have an easier uh, uh, work to follow the different questions and to assign them to the speakers. And what you will also, um, see is the handout section there we have already preloaded a couple of the resources that actually fair is fair has produced in several links that might be interesting to you um, later in the session so um, with with that being said i just want to uh, move forward with introducing eoa a little bit and what we have been doing in terms of open science for those of you who uh, do not know uh, eoa we are a membership organization representing some 850 uh, universities around 48 countries in Europe, in the wider, wider Europe area, and we have been active on open science for several years now across uh, different issues. We have worked, for example, on open access to publications. We have uh, worked a lot on career assessment uh, and very recently uh, have also um, worked a lot on fair data and research data management, which is the topic for today. We are following the European Open Science Cloud uh, policy uh, issues. We have been a member of the Open Science Policy Platform of the EU. And we're following different issues about open science and in the European research area and as well in Horizon Europe. And also we do a little bit on the legislation that actually supports uh, open science. And um, also recently we have been joining the uh, UNESCO partnership on open science that is really working towards a global um, definition and also recommendation on what open science should uh, look like and what uh, countries around the world can do to mainstream open science. Now, uh, this being said, I just would like to highlight one thing that we actually have open right now. We have a survey about uh, institutional approaches to open science at universities that has just been extended until uh, 15 of January. So please, um, if you haven't answered the, uh, the survey yet, please feel free to check out the link. I've put this link actually in the handout section so you can go there. If you click, I think it's download, then you will be able to, to see the link and maybe uh, start uh, working on this uh, survey or to submit it until the 15th of January. Now, so much about uh, EOA. This is uh, today a co-production uh, of sorts uh, of EOA being a partner in Fair's Fair, but also highlighting some of the recommendations that uh, came out of the project. So Fair's Fair is actually a European project that is funded uh, through the, by the Horizon 2020 as part of the work program on the European Open Science Cloud. It has uh, some 22 partners. It's a very large project that is running uh, now for, um, for more than one and a half years. And we will be running this project until uh, February 2022. Now, the project encompasses a whole a lot of issues uh, and topics ranging uh, from, from interoperability to uh, networks of digital repositories to maturity models for FAIR data. So we're really tackling the entire kind of, uh, cycle of FAIR issues in, uh, as they come in different uh, organizations and different areas of, uh, of research and work related to FAIR data. Um, EOA is, is a partner. I'm a work package leader myself on a uh, work package on training and skills for FAIR data. But this uh, webinar today looks at the policies, at the in, in, mainly at the institutional level, and a little bit uh, at the support that actually um, enables and facilitates FAIR data. So many of the resources, uh, as I said, there are in the handout section that are relevant for today. I, uh, the project is, is way too big to introduce everything here in a, in a few uh, words. So please feel free to check out the website um, and, and see for yourself. Uh, we hope that there are many resources there that will hopefully uh, help you or inspire you in thinking about how to approach fair data in, at the institutional level. Uh, just to say also a little bit about why we're actually doing this webinar. You, um, you will see here a slide that 
just show us a little bit about the evolution of how EOA has monitored uh, research data management at universities. And uh, I don't want to go into uh, all the details and the charts. It might be actually a little bit difficult to read them. But you, what you see here in the top left chart is a slide, uh, is a question that we asked in the survey in 2016 about the, the existence of, fair, of research data policies at universities. And back then, some 18% of respondents said that they actually had a policy. This increased a little bit uh, to a survey that we had in 2017, where some 21% uh, answered that they had a policy, but an additional, actually 38% said that, that they were in the process of developing a policy. So there has been a little bit of an evolution of how this topic is addressed at universities, maybe more awareness, but also just a growth in the number of universities that really uh, start working on research data management. And then last year, we also had a survey that looked at um, fair data specifically. It's, uh, yeah, I think it's not, maybe not that well uh, visible here, but we asked a similar question about uh, universities having a, a research data policy. And then we asked a subsequent question about the elements of the policy. And there we saw that actually uh, fair data is in the, in, at the universities that actually have a research data policy. Even there, it's not yet uh, standard yet to be included very explicitly or even implicitly. So they are, uh, I think around one quarter said that they, yes, they mentioned FAIR, but that was of the 60% that had a, fair, a research data policy. So there's still, I would say a lot of uh, space, a lot of room for improvement to actually move the policies and the institutional context towards uh, more uh, supportive actions of FAIR data towards more explicitly ad addressing FAIR data in in policies towards building the support services that uh, tackle fair data. And this is really what we tried to, to do with this uh, webinar here today to show some of the recommendations that came out uh, and the resources that came out from the project, uh, fair is fair, and also some good practices and also uh, one side, uh, the European level and the funding, um, uh, the funding uh, incentives that come out from Horizon Europe, for instance. So, for that purpose, we have put together a program of uh, three uh, external speakers here. The first one, and you can see him, I think, already is Kostas Repanas, who is a policy officer at the European Commission in the Open Science Unit. He is, I think, one of the experts uh, on fair data within that unit who has worked uh, on that topic. I think he's recently also worked on the fair on the COVID uh, data portal. So he has really experience in also putting that into practice and, and showing how important accessible and, and reusable data is uh, with a very practical exam example this year. Then we will be joined uh, by Joy Davidson. Hopefully she has had some technical issues that I hope will be resolved. Uh, she is the work package leader on the FAIR policy sites uh, within the FAIR's FAIR project, and she's based at the DCC, the Digital Curation Center at the Universities of uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh. So she's uh, really uh, one of the experts on that uh, topic from uh, from the project and also from one of the organizations that really uh, lead on these issues um, throughout Europe. And finally, to give uh, also some very interesting institutional perspective, there's Christina Hetner, who's a digital scholarship librarian at the Center for Digital Scholarship at the Leiden uh, University. She will give some institutional practical insights of how they approach their data and research data management and how the support and the policies there work um, towards uh, yeah, making more research data fair and uh, actually enabling researchers to uh, produce more fair data over time. Um, that was my introduction, so I think we can uh, move to the first speaker, and that would be uh, Kostas. If uh, I think my colleague will set up the presentation in uh, in a moment. Yes, thank you. So, Kostas, yeah, the floor uh, is yours. Yes. Uh, hello. I hope you can hear me. Hi, Leonard, and everyone. Yes, I can hear you. Great. Great, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. It's a great uh, webinar. Uh, very glad to, to be speaking here. Uh, I'll just give you a, a brief overview of what is to, let's say, what, what do we expect of, of what's coming in Horizon Europe, um, mainly in respect to, uh, with respect to uh, fair data and uh, overall in our open science policy in the European Commission. Uh, as Leonard said, I work at the open science unit of uh, the European Commission. And um, 
just uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, some of these uh, um, sort of statements are uh, common knowledge, but um, we really value open science at the European Commission. Uh, we believe that uh, this is uh, a, a great uh, aspect of, of how uh, sharing knowledge and tools as early as possible uh, can uh, greatly accelerate uh, science and, and progress and uh, improve the quality and efficiency of uh, research as well as increase the trust of uh, society in science. Uh, also, uh, again, uh, common knowledge for, for many of you here, but uh, we have seen what uh, the, the pandemic uh, created a, a very big crisis in, in the, the whole world. And to be able to have such a response uh, to, to this kind of pandemic or the uh, Ebola pandemic, um, we need to, to be able to, to act fast and to share data and resources is uh, among different uh, disciplines and among nations as well. So collaboration is also very important and uh, also open science helps to reduce inequalities, uh, which is uh, something that we are uh, pushing a lot for uh, in the European Commission. And um, just a, a number there that you see, uh, and many people are, are sort of uh, surprised by that, uh, that number of 10 billion per year that we lose in opportunity cost by not having fair data. And this was an estimate um, that PwC uh, did a study for us in 2017. And this is really significant, uh, significant cost. Uh, of course, uh, what we are about to see in Horizon Europe, I will keep saying that we're likely and about to see because a lot of these things are not uh, a done deal, let's say. It's not uh, decided, but uh, we will see an evolution because always what we try in the European Commission is to introduce slowly different uh, policies uh, after consultation with uh, different communities and with the member states, of course. So, um, as you probably know, we started with an open access uh, pilot, open access to publications. Uh, then this became slowly mandatory, uh, accompanied by an open research data pilot. Then the open research data pilot became sort of more uh, mainstream feature. And uh, now, uh, what's coming in Horizon Europe, we're going to see a lot more emphasis on fair data and responsible research data management. So what we really want is to embed open science practices across the uh, Horizon Europe program. Uh, we're talking about evaluation of proposals. The grant agreement will reflect some of those issues. And the reporting, we expect that beneficiaries will report uh, all along the project's lifetime, how they are doing and, and some of those indicators uh, that are relevant to, to open science. And again, um, just to be a bit more concrete, um, the whole principle will be similar to what we have now in Horizon 2020, which is as open as possible, as close as necessary regarding uh, research data. Uh, but uh, what will change in Horizon Europe will be that we will start already in the evaluation of proposals to request some preliminary uh, RDM research data management considerations. Uh, and then we will ask from all uh, projects, regardless of whether they're going to share data or not, to uh, create a data management plan. So this is a big difference uh, for the moment. If someone opts out from data, from open data sharing, they will not. They don't have to create a data management plan. This will be different in Horizon Europe. It's a very big um, sort of uh, difference, I would say, and it moves to the right direction, which means that um, you know what we talk about open data and fair data is actually good and responsible data management. So this is something I would like to to highlight uh, to everybody. And together with that, we are about to see some other practices like depositing data in a repository. Um, and the repositories have to be selected carefully. We will have some guidance for beneficiaries. So do they provide PIDs? Uh, do they have metadata enough for users to be able to, to for others to reuse the data? And in some uh, specific um, actions of the work program, we may have requirements to use uh, repositories that are federated under EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud. And together with that, we're about to see also uh, encouragement for licenses that are uh, CC BY or CC0 or equivalent. 
And uh, something else that I want to highlight is that uh, we start to talk a lot about other research outputs, right? So not only data, but uh, software, algorithms, protocols, workflows, and models. So anything that can be uh, digitally shared, we want to have this in the data management plan, but also physical outputs of a project, like for example, reagents or antibodies, or even hardware. Uh, again, this should be described in the data management plan. And to the best effort of the beneficiaries, we would like them to be uh, as open uh, uh, as possibly shared. So we want to be able to reuse all these outputs and uh, we want to we want other scientists, other researchers to be able to build on top of this uh, knowledge that is being created. And you will see that I make a special mention at the end to software because one effort now together with other uh, partners also in rda research data alliance and some of the eos projects uh, we try to see what does it mean to have fair software uh, you will see that if you go through the principles some of them are let's say not so uh, well uh, apt for uh, software some others are so there may be a, a need for uh, some sort of uh, revision or adaptation there and um, I would like also to mention what Leonard said about the COVID-19 uh, data portal, which is part of the European COVID-19 data platform. This was launched in April, on 20th of April, and is a priority pilot for the European Open Science Cloud. It's actually a, a, a sort of way of showing to the world what we mean about fair data in action. So how can we have early sharing of data that can be reused, can be processed, we can have the correct metadata to be able to advance uh, research on SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 disease. How can we make all this knowledge as open and as fair as possible? And we have seen with this platform that has gained a lot of traction within this uh, seven, eight months from its uh, launch that uh, researchers really need to have access to, to different data types, different uh, resources. And then when these are all fair, then we can see a lot of uh, research that is being done on top of uh, existing knowledge. Um, now this, uh, so we talk a lot about uh, fair and fair principles, but how can we be more concrete? And this is something that we get a lot as uh, question from uh, beneficiaries, from researchers, and I'm sure, uh, for example, Leonard will also get this uh, question uh, from universities. And indeed, what we're trying is to to be able to mainstream the fair practices and universities i have to say play a, a very big role uh, in this and this is being discussed a lot also in the eosc uh, working group for training and skills and um, what we noticed at some point was that we cannot compare the evaluation of uh, fairness so how fair is a data set and can we actually be able to compare different uh, mechanisms for assessing fairness? So I will mention a couple of uh, initiatives in this um, uh, regard. So it's the RDA Working Group uh, Fair Data Maturity Model and the Fairware Initiative. So first for RDA, the Research Data Alliance, uh, this was a group that was together with the community initiated with the help of the commission. We also provided some financial support for this. Uh, so I have to say that the group now has finished uh, the, the work. Uh, the group worked for 18 months on developing a set of indicators. Uh, we, we like to call them Lego building blocks uh, for fairness. So they are priority uh, indicators, uh, breaking down the, the four uh, fair principles uh, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. And together with that, we have also guidelines on how people can use them. And this is mainly addressed to either, um, you know, uh, people, developers that uh, build uh, fair assessment uh, tools. This is one, uh, one way. But also, this can be used for uh, self-assessment. So researchers can be able to uh, estimate uh, sort of how fair is my, my data set. And this can go actually hand in hand with having a good data management plan. And by answering some questions, uh, we can see that the, the fairness, as we say, can be improved. And of course, this leads to better chances for uh, reuse. And of course, funders like, like us and others are interested to use this 
to uh, also check uh, compliance uh, against fair requirements. Um, related to this is, a, is an initiative called Fairware Initiative. This has been um, initiated by uh, Rory, which is the Research on Research Institute, uh, backed by the Wellcome Trust in the UK and many, many funders across the world. And Fair is Fair assigned an MOU with uh, Rory to work together in this action. And actually, this is uh, currently ongoing. We are very much hoping that uh, this may actually uh, produce an open source tool that can be used by everyone. And we are trying to see how the knowledge created in the EOS projects and Fair is Fair uh, can actually uh, be used and, and be uh, appreciated by many uh, around the world, funders or uh, researchers or institutions that uh, want to evaluate fairness. Uh, very quickly, I will just say that uh, Fair is Fair is also working on some uh, pilot projects for automatic assessment. Uh, one is called Fuji. So um, the links are live, so you can uh, later check on the, uh, on the slides. So Fuji is an automatic assessment tool. And I have to say that we see a very good continuation by um, starting from the RDA uh, indicators of the fair data maturity model that then fair is fair adapted and now these are used in this fuji tool and then fair aware is more of a questionnaire based um, evaluation for uh, indeed uh, people being aware of how fair is, is my data set uh, finally let me just say that uh, another project related to eosk eosk synergy this is one of the regional uh, projects of eosk is also working on on similar um, ways of evaluating uh, fairness more on a tec technical framework and we had a very good um, uh, webinar the other day of all those eos related projects together with fair is fair that are trying to pull their efforts and come up with better ways to assess and evaluate uh, fairness finally i would just like to say that um, we have uh, seen the importance of open science policies, but we don't just focus on open data that cannot be uh, found, cannot be discovered, and cannot be reused. So we give a lot of emphasis on uh, fair data. There will be concrete uh, requirements of the beneficiaries, and we hope that in this way, other funders will also pick up on those issues and be able to uh, sort of mainstream these, these practices of, of what I said is uh, actually part of just uh, good uh, data management, responsible data management. And we hope that, um, as I said in the last point, this is quite important, that we see fair as a, as a journey so the assessment of fairness uh, is not a way to punish beneficiaries or researchers, but we want to educate them to raise awareness. And ultimately, we want to increase data reuse. And I think I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention and happy to answer any questions. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Costas. So that was uh, that was already really interesting, um, and it's very nice that you also highlight some of the fair fair outputs actually <laughs> from the side of the commission. So I would now try to get Joy Davidson um, presenting. Um, Joy, can you give us a sign if uh, if you yes. can hear us? Yes, yes, yeah, just I for the audience. You. Can you hear me? I can hear you. That that is great. So just for the audience, Joy had some technical. Thank you so much yes. for your <laughs> flexibility with the technical problems. Um, right. So I will just uh, progress through the slides, and maybe Leonard, if you would mind moving them, um, you can go to the first slide, please. Um, yes. Uh, and the next. Yeah, that's perfect. So yes, my name is Joy Davidson, and I'm uh, leading Work Package Three for Fair Fair, and I work with uh, Leonard and Brecht and the others at EUA to, to look at uh, what FAIR means in practice. So we're trying to improve the availability and reuse of FAIR data. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, over the course of 2019 and 2020, we've done a lot of landscape analysis work just to try and get a sense of where we currently are and maybe what needs to happen to try and uh, progress things to the, to the vision that Costas was, was mentioning that we are, would like to see become more the norm as we move into Horizon Europe. So as part of that, we have a couple of uh, landscape analysis um, reports, one that looks at policy, 
um, and one that looks specifically at the situation of uh, FAIR in European higher education institutions. What um, we did also come out with as a result of this landscaping activity was a set of policy enhancement recommendations. Um, and we'll spend the next few minutes looking at, at some of those. I, I think the key thing to flag up before we start sharing any of the recommendations is that these are recommendations aimed at a broad range of different policymakers. So while many will be relevant to people who work in higher education institutions, some may be more relevant to um, policymakers at the national level or funding bodies and, and publishers. So it, it is very much a broad set of recommendations, and they will be applicable to varying degrees to the different stakeholders. Uh, so that, with that caveat, maybe then we can move on to the, the next slide, please. So the, the first slide um, is just to give a, one of the kind of key recommendations that we, we came up with. Um, so as part of our landscape assessment, we tried to look um, at uh, about 42 different policies that came out from different stakeholders, or funders, um, publishers, and universities were the key groups that we looked at. And we tried to pick um, a good sample of policies from people that we thought were quite mature in, in respect to um, engaging with open science and the FAIR principles already. And we came up with a way to characterize the policies so that we could compare them and try to get a sense of how well uh, the, the current policies reflected uh, the FAIR ecosystem. So I think the, the first kind of thing we found is it's very, very hard <laughs> to compare these policies without going with this kind of a structured approach. Um, so one of the key recommendations we would like to try to take forward with all of the policymakers is to try and get a better sense of which policy elements um, we came up with 42 as part of our review, which maybe is too many, but which of these really can we start to distill as being the core elements that need to be in an open science policy and to support FAIR. So collectively, we should be able to try and come up with this. I think you know, I've put the link in here to our set of 42 policy characterization elements that people can feel free to have a look at. Um, but I think the other kind of uh, point to bring up here that's quite relevant is that as we're seeing the European Open Science Cloud take shape and the various kinds of rules uh, are starting to be defined, um, one of the things that the Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda made clear is that they would like to be able to start to monitor um, standardized open science and fair data strategies and policies. So really to allow this to happen, we really do have to come up with a, a better way to make them um, structured and comparable. So that, that was our, our key um, first recommendation. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, the next key recommendation we have, and it's very closely linked to the first one, is that really what we're trying to move towards is a, a more machine-readable policy, something that is structured um, comparable and that can actually uh, give some indication as to what has to happen, so the, the rules, if you like. Um, so to move towards this sort of a, a vision, one of the things we think has to happen is that policy should have a, a persistent identifier applied to the actual policy itself. It should be clearly versioned as to which kind of uh, policy it is. Is it the current policy? Is it... Uh, you know, version 1, version 1 1.2. Uh, we really need to have these kinds of um, specifics made clear in the policies themselves. Um, without that, it's very difficult to see how we can start to move into a machine actionable workflow where we might be able to pull in policies from different stakeholders to get a sense of, of what might need to happen. And, and, you know, in an ideal world, we'd love to see something like that happening in a data management plan where you might be able to pull in uh, different policies from different stakeholders and be able to come up with what is the kind of bare minimum you need to uh, achieve within your data management planning. Um, so that, that is something that we need to, to work towards. I think one of the key and, and possibly the quickest win <laughs> that we can uh, recommend is that it's, um, it was amazing to us how often there was no date associated with any of the policies that we found. Um, so really, this is something super simple and everybody can do. Make really clear when the policy comes into effect and when it will be um, running towards, uh, you know, when, when the end 
stage comes in. So that, that's something that we would certainly think is a really quick win and everybody can do. I think um, to come back to this notion about machine actionability and rules, one of the other things that we've noticed is that quite a lot of um, universities and other stakeholders will make their policies visible um, as a web page rather than a PDF or, or something that is maybe a little bit more um, kind of tangible and can be put into a repository. So this might be something that we want to, to move towards. And again, uh, the other thing we noticed was that it's very difficult sometimes to separate out the rules from the things that are just nice to have. So we really need to kind of be clearer on what people must do versus what we think is just good practice that we would suggest that they do. So that, that is something that we'd like to, to progress. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, that would be great. Thank you. I think the other key thing to, to flag up from our uh, recommendations is that we're not saying at this stage that there has to be explicit, explicitly mentioned in a policy. Um, I think when we looked at the policies, particularly of the universities, it was pretty clear that most of them were very clearly aligned with FAIR principles implicitly. So while they're not actually saying the word FAIR in their policies, most of what they're suggesting would uh, align with what we're hoping to see within the FAIR principles. Um, whether you want to make a, a, an explicit reference to FAIR in your policy really kind of depends on your organization and your own missions and, and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, we know some universities um, that we've worked with are, are very keen to be seen as leaders in promoting the FAIR agenda and, and really kind of embracing open science. In those cases, it might be very practical and it might be sensible to, to make that a, a really clearly stated vision within their policies. It might completely align with their strategic objectives. Um, in other organizations, maybe that's not, not entirely what you want to, to do. Um, we actually had some interviews as part of our landscaping, um, and we spoke to some publishers actually who had you know, implicitly aligned with FAIR, but made a clear statement that they didn't see any real kind of point in the future where they would be saying that their policies are FAIR and using that term in their policy because it was still something that researchers found a little bit difficult to understand. So th there's lots of reasons that you might want to include it or not include it, and I think it really depends on your own organization and what you're trying to achieve. Um, I think one of the things you might want to consider is, um, you know, basically researchers tend to listen more to the, the policies of the funders. They will um, be very careful to make sure that they're adhering where necessary to funders. So if your funder is explicitly talking about FAIR, um, maybe then the university policy only has to say that we expect you to adhere with policies of your funders. So, so there are lots of things that you can consider to be implicitly aligning with FAIR um, rather than perhaps being explicit, but it really is up to you. Uh, the next slide would be great, please. Thank you. And I think this kind of comes back to what Costas was saying. Um, it's not just about the, the data itself. There are lots of other things that we need to start to consider. Um, uh, you, you mentioned reaction uh, agents and, and things like this. So it, it can often be physical samples. Um, we tend to forget those, but we shouldn't. We, we need to think about these in our policies as well. And we need to think about things like software, models, um, and, and various things that maybe currently aren't that well understood. So the policies really should be quite clear about this, and we've seen a lot of good examples of policies that very clearly state what the policy covers. And if we do want to, inc to include a whole range of things, then it's, it's worth making that clear within the policy itself. I think the other thing that we recommend is that um, it's really kind of important to work with communities of practice to determine what is fair enough because in different disciplines, um, fair can mean different things. And I, I think um, it's not for us to impose what it means to a certain community of practice. We need to listen to what they're saying. Uh, there's work going on by GoFair to try and come up with uh, fair implementation profiles that are discipline-specific. These are very useful things, and we should be looking to try and incorporate these into our institutional policies and practices so that we're um, understanding what it means to be fair enough for uh, the, the kinds of researchers that we're supporting. So these maybe don't feed into your policy itself, but rather the related services at your institution. Um, I just wanted to flag up that we have been doing some work in Fair is Fair to support um, a bunch of different repositories to try and align with 
the FAIR implementation profiles and the, the FAIR data points that have been promoted by GoFAIR. And there is a webinar tomorrow. If anybody is interested, it's, it's open to anyone who'd like to attend and hear our, our uh, experiences so far um, so that you can have a look at the link and, and follow that if you're interested. Can we move to the next slide, please? Um, the next slide here is just to flag up that FAIR does not mean open. Um, I think that was one of the misconceptions that we quite often encounter when we talk to uh, people at the, the universities and not just the researchers but also people who work in the support roles. It's important to make clear that FAIR data does not equal open. There can be FAIR closed data as well, and there can be many good reasons for not sharing research data. Um, one of the things we recommend is that you know universities should start to help researchers to make this jump from just saying, I can't share it, so nothing can be shared, to thinking, I can't share the data, but I can certainly share the metadata. The metadata for my data set can be fair. So one of the things that we would like to flag up is, is examples of good practice, and, and one that I've picked out here is something that has been uh, put in place by the University of Manchester. And in their data management support pages, they have created a, a really nice set of um, a templates, if you like, on statements that you can use to start to say um, what level of data access you can have. Um, so there's lots of sample statements there, and it you know, tells you where you should insert the DOI. These kinds of really practical steps are, are very useful. So I think that is certainly something that any institution might want to replicate uh, is this sort of example of good practice to try and encourage people to um, think about what they can share and how they would go about doing it and making clear why something can't be shared, for, for example. Okay, we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, Costas also mentioned um, there's lots of requirements on data management plans from different funding bodies. Uh, many universities also have uh, requirements in their policies for um, developing a data management plan at the grant application stage or at the start of research. Um, I think what we would pick up on is, I, I think Costas picked up on this as well, is that the policy, policy should also make clear that it's not just having a plan at the start, but really it's updating the plan. The, the emphasis really needs to be moving on to keeping the plan up to date and moving towards perhaps something like an end stage data management plan, which really then gives you the sense of what happened in, in actual practice versus what was um, the ideal plan at the, the outset because the two can be very different. So we really want to be moving away from the idealized view of what was supposed to happen and get a sense of what actually did happen. So encouraging that sort of activity in the policy and making sure it's not just a box ticking exercise but something that is encouraged over the life cycle is, is very good. Um, I think one of the other things that we picked up on in, in, in our recommendations was the fact that we think it should definitely be um, focus on rewarding good practice at the moment. We're, we're not really assuming that anybody should have policies in place and be policing them and, and using sticks rather than carrots. Um, penalties seem to be um, a disincentive <laughs> to many people to engage with this. So we would certainly say, yes, let's, for, for the time being, focus on rewarding good practice. Um, I think as we move forward over the next few years, we may have to consider penalties for... Um, you know, frequent non-compliance with, with rules. Um, who puts those into place and who would be the right motivator are things we have to consider. Um, I think one of the things we also have to consider with um, uh, rewarding and, and introducing penalties is that to do that, you actually have to monitor compliance with the policy, which is tricky to do. It's, it's time intensive and we need to consider how that will work. Um, so if you're writing policies and saying lots of things that people must do, it's, it's always good to bear in mind how are you going to actually be able to monitor this and, and will there be any kind of repercussions. So um, something to bear in mind as well. Uh, if we could go on to the next slide, please. Uh, this is just another um, finding from our, our landscape assessment. Um, it's not one of the recommendations. Um, it's basically just to say that Local support is seen as a key enabler. If we want people to become more um, active practitioners leading towards having fair outputs, then having local support is, is very crucial. So there are lots of um, different models and, and ways to do that. Um, you're going to hear a little bit 
uh, later on today from uh, Christina, and she'll give you an example of how they're doing things at Leiden. But um, it's important to note that there is no single way to do this correctly. Every university is slightly different. They're structured in, in different units, and there's lots of different relationships and workflows in place. So it's important to try and work out how um, you can start to do this with what you have at your own institution. Um, and there are differences in terms of what resources are available. Um, so for those institutions who maybe don't have a lot of, of resource to work with, um, we're seeing interesting things where we're getting um, sort of collaborative pro approaches, and we've seen this with the, the Swiss, uh, the Swedish uh, country example, um, where they have different research support staff and different organizations who are pooling together their knowledge to be able to deliver um, data stewardship um, support uh, with, with limited resources, but pooling in uh, different kinds of, of expertise from across different universities. So. Um, try to think creatively about how you can provide data stewardship support and, and try to make sure that it's um, uh, at least something there, if it's a web page or pointers to external resources, whatever you can do, I think any kind of local support will, will be helpful. Uh, and just to point out that Fair is Fair is actually um, running some data stewardship training courses. These are things that we'll be uh, coordinating between now and the end of the project, so we'll post details of, of those on the website as they become available. Uh, I think we can move on to the last slide. Uh, and the last slide is really just to um, encourage you now to maybe consider working with us. Um, we have just opened an open call. And this is open to anybody who um, is a policymaker and at any level, whether you're working at a university, whether you're a funder, whether you're a publisher, we, we want to work with a broad range of stakeholders. But ideally what we're, we're offering is um, a chance for us to help you have a look at your policy in light of the recommendations that we've come up with to give you a, a steer on where we think maybe you could start to um, align your policies with, with the FAIR principles a little bit better. So if that is something that you're interested in, um, as I said, this just came out yesterday, so you can follow the link, and there's a very short kind of online forum to register your interest. And that will be open until the 22nd of January. So if you're interested in that, please do um, take a look. And I think that is everything for me. So thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Katerina, uh, to Christina now, sorry. Yes, and I'm, I just got an error message that my microphone isn't working, but I think if it's working, then Christina, it's now time to, for you to pick up. And I see you. So thank you, Joy, as well, for, for presenting. And um, yeah, uh, let's move to Christina, because we, I think we're running late a little bit. So thank you. and. Thank you. Yeah, I also get this message that my microphone is um, not hearing at a certain time. So, well, I hope it will be going uh, going fine. That's okay. Okay. So, um, thank you indeed for inviting me to talk about the inclusive approach to FAIR at the Leiden University Libraries. And I am indeed Christina Hetne from the Center for Digital Scholarship at the Leiden University Library. So at, uh, so Leiden University is a broad university and uh, the Center for Digital Scholarship provides support for research data management, uh, copyrights, um, open access, but also use of digital data. And we are now a team of uh, nine people that you can see on the right hand side and working on different areas. I myself, and most involved in the data management and open access. And we give events and workshops, but also focus on specific projects where we try to help researchers in um, the digital data and uh, also uh, making data fair. And just to mention that we are trying to focus really on the FAIR principles and not the acronym of FAIR. So I'm not going to read the principles to you because you probably <laughs> know them. But uh, yeah, just to mention that that is, yeah, that's where we are trying to focus on and uh, not dividing too much from the actual FAIR principles. That's, of course, were published in the links you can find uh, below. 
and also the link to the go fair where they're try to be a bit more explainable about the principles and what they are about so some current training and consultancy service examples um, for training we give a how to write a data management plan workshop every six weeks to researchers in from the whole university we also have uh, specific courses on writing a data management plan for institutes like psychology for example and really try to work together with that institute or faculty to develop uh, the course with specific content uh, for the for that audience and well writing a data management plan would in my opinion be the the first step towards fair so it's really the uh, it has its place here we also have workshops on really hands-on bring your own data workshops where we help researchers making the data fair and really focusing on the interoperability and reusability part of their data doing the data modeling and uh, looking at you know, how they can um, uh, yeah really focusing not only on depositing their data somewhere but really making it reusable we also have workshops on how to publish your data where we do focus more on okay where how do you create a data publishing package what should you include uh, what can you exclude and what uh, yeah where where should you uh, publish your data and what are the benefits to to doing that some examples on consultancy services is a, a verification project that we had on an existing born digital scholarly archive. Um, we also worked together with the Leiden University uh, Center for Linguistics to create a sort of a metadata database of their legacy data that was actually spread around the whole faculty in researchers' drawers or you know their laptops or whatever you find uh, data. So that at least that data uh, is, well, they know where it is and we can describe it. And it's an ongoing project. So it also includes digitizing and uh, actually depositing of data. Mm. So now about the policy. So that was <clears throat> taken into effect in April, 2016. It's divided in um, before, during, and after research, where it starts with, well, writing a data management plan as the first step. And during research, it's about, well, securing the storage, so the integrity, availability, and confidentiality. And after that data must be made, uh, remain available for 10 years, it should be fair um, and we should also provide the documentation and the metadata with software for reuse and archive the data in a certified archive. To actually implement that um, policy, there, was, uh, there is an ongoing research data management implementation program. So the priority has been on the findability and accessibility where the Center for Digital Scholarship have been delivering second and first line support to researchers. And the focus has been on you know, depositing data in a trusted digital repository in line with government gu guidelines, uh, funders and publishers policies. In the coming years, we are really trying to focus more on the interoperability and reusability, where the Center for Digital Scholarship will be and delivering the second line support and embedded domain data stewards will deliver uh, the first line support. And there is of course a need for agreement on domain specific standards. I mean, this is one of the most common questions we get from researchers when they fill out the data management plan or when they try to make the data fair. They just don't know or they, especially if they are starting in that, uh, if they are starting PhD students, what are um, the standards that they should use? And there is international engagement needed for this. So we, at the, the Center for Digital Scholarship, we are helping to set up a method to get together with GoFair, CoData, RDA, and the World Data System 
that can also be used within the own university for making data fair. And it's called, well, the, the three point verification framework, which are depicted here, and also Joy mentioned briefly, where we can run metadata for machine workshops, uh, creating for implementation profiles. And um, well, at least some of the data could be on a fair data point. So you can read more about it in the link there as well. Mm. Just to mention that these, so these leading practices that um, that need to go into protocol. So we have the light and research data management regulation. Uh, we have the light, light and research data management program, and on. I tried to divide this uh, into two parts for one about the interoperable and reusable and the other part about findable and accessible. So for findable and accessible, we can set up university-wide training and university-wide services because it's just not, yeah, it's just not that complicated, <laughs> so to say. Uh, and the leading policies and regulations following the FAIR principles coming from the European Commission or national research funding organizations, universities. Well, they need to, of course, interact with these training and we need to make sure that they are aligned and there's feedback in developing these uh, services and training. For interoperable and reusable, we really need to look to the actual faculty or the institute for developing training and services. And uh, to do that, there is a more need for this technical and social infrastructure implementing solutions uh, following the FAIR principles that are being uh, developed within, for example, the CoData, RDA, GoFair type organizations. It's more um, of a bottom-up approach, seeing what the main uh, specific knowledge that is, uh, that is needed. Now about some lessons learned. So about this international uh, collaboration that I just mentioned that we really need uh, to collaborate closely with these type of organizations to co-develop leading practices and implementation guidelines for FAIR. So we can also inform uh, back, sort of have this sort of feedback loop from the first time experiences that we have when teaching uh, and training, supporting researchers, and actual project projects to create FAIR data. So the advantage for Leiden to really be part of these activities is that, well, we can deliver machine actionable FAIR data support and training to researchers next to input for the institutional protocols that is informed by latest developments. But the challenge to this is that it can only be achieved when data stewards have the means and the skills to implement not only the principles of findability and accessibility, but also the much more difficult principles of interoperability and reusability. That brings me to the last slide about the lessons learned so for data stewardship, skills building and resources that a data steward should possess a number of basic skills in the fields of information technology and computer science, next to innovation and collaborative skills. And next to that, well, they also need to be given the opportunity in the form of time and funding to take part in these sort of leading practices activities, because data stewardship is a new profession and it needs to be developed further. So you need to have the right sort of balance between innovation and actual sort of duties, which uh, something in the world, so I am a researcher with my background. I was a senior researcher before, before going into the library. And it is, when I came in, it was just not so known that you can actually, you know, you go to a conference as a support staff and you actually present and you do th things yourself, you need to be part of it and not only absorb and sort of <laughs> take with you and uh, and start to teach. And that is something that is still, I think, very much changing in this whole, um, yeah, in this whole environment, this whole support environment. So, yeah, I would say to data stewards out there to really try to be part of at least one of these 
data stewardship networks or professionalizing groups out there to develop yourself and for universities and policies to give the opportunity for your data stewards to do that. So thank you very much. And uh, if you want to read more about what I talked about today, we had a paper out just recently in the data science journal, but I try to elaborate a bit more on these topics. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that, that was interesting. I think we have seen really an interesting kind of progression now from the European funders over recommendations from from Fair is Fair to how you do it um, in a way on the on the ground uh, within a university. I see there are already a couple of, of questions in the chat. And um, just for all those who are watching us, I, I think we, we, we had a little bit of a time, but we can stay on like five minutes later so that we in the end have some 10 minutes um, for for the questions that have been asked in the chat. And I hope if you can stay as participants also for five minutes more that then you will see some of these questions uh, being answered. I'm not sure if all of them can be because there are quite a couple of, uh, of them now. So actually I would maybe start with a few ones that seem to be easier to answer for Christina. And there is, there is one um, on how mandatory are trainings, for example, for researchers and, uh, and staff. And that really, I think there's also another one that asked about if there is any uh, anything offered in terms of like uh, training for library professionals actually from the Center for Digital Scholarship. Yeah, sorry, I missed the, la the last uh, one was a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, it but... was about if there is something like an international program where library professionals can maybe visit your center and learn a little bit how you do it. Yeah. Okay, so about the first question, how mandatory the, the trainings are, that actually depends on the institute. So like I said, well, Leiden University is a broad university, but it's also a decentralized university. So faculties and institutes have a lot of own influence on how they do things. And at some institutes, it actually is mandatory to take the training on how to write a data management plan and actually write the plan. And at some institutes, it's not yet. So yeah, it depends. For um, the other trainings that we have on making data fair, they are not mandatory at all. They are there to, to help and uh, to, yeah, uh, to offer that. About the um, international program, well, we have had many visits actually before the pandemic uh, <laughs> to our center where we uh, facilitate uh, from many different countries around the world actually coming to us uh, half a day or a whole day. And uh, that's always possible. And we have, we'll have one that I'm scheduling now, but it'll be online of course uh, for next year. Yeah, thank you. I think that that's that's also interesting to share. Of course, the experience in in this area, how you actually provide this support, uh, is I think also very important to to just uh, yeah support institutions that are just starting on this uh, this journey. I see there's another question uh, for for Costas in this case, and that is a little bit on the side of uh, machine read actionable actionable or readable uh, data management plans. So is, how how will the Commission support, if if you will, uh, the development yeah. in this field. And I think maybe in general, how how you will support more fair data in Horizon Europe, um, besides the requirements for DMPs. Maybe that would be interesting. Yeah. So in general, we we hope to have um, as much uh, guidelines and guidance as possible. So together with the um, what is known as the model grant agreement we always have the annotated grant agreement which uh, it's a very detailed document and uh, contains a lot of information for beneficiaries on, on what are their uh, um, obligations what are the requirements but on top of that we will have we already have uh, of course a website which we update much um, much faster and there we will have a lot of guidance again for example on repositories 
uh, there will be more or less some kind of uh, tiered approach. So which repositories to prefer when you have a certain uh, data set, data type, or if you are from this discipline, prefer those kind of repositories. Again, we see in Ferris Fair uh, efforts to sort of modernize the core trust seal certification uh, to account for the fair principles. So, you know, if this becomes a, a sort of standard, we may ask uh, that repositories uh, that have these certifications are, are preferred. Uh, we heard about uh, some uh, rules in EOSC in the European Open Science Cloud. Again, these as they emerge, because a lot of this is ongoing work, uh, this will become uh, clearer for, for beneficiaries and I believe easier for them to, uh, to sort of comply with the requirements. For the machine actionability, this is something that um, we, we, are, we are very passionate about, but you have to realize that even within the Commission, uh, my wish list may not be what, what uh, in the end will happen in Horizon Europe. So let's say that we are trying very hard to, to have this. It may not be uh, there in the first uh, instance, the first year perhaps, um, because uh, what you have to realize is that what we are trying to connect actually the, the data management plan, um, the evaluation, and the reporting. So we, we would like to see this as a, as a continuous pipeline, which if you think about it, it makes sense for us as a funder, but also for the beneficiary, because they really can uh, enter things in the DMP that get transferred to the reporting template. And then you, know, you don't have to uh, enter again and again the same information. And there's where we believe the machine actionability will help. So both in creating the DMP, uh, so we are thinking of uh, whether we could have some sort of uh, even, you know, uh, drop downs that, that people can uh, get advice for maybe it's licenses or repositories, or if not, if it's a more liberal sort of create your own DMP with, with a tool and then upload it. But then how do we make this machine actionable to be able to, let's say, talk to uh, the, the reporting requirements, then this is still ongoing work. But we are also looking at RDA because there is a, a working group there that has done quite a lot of work. Uh, there are a lot of pilots, and if something emerges as, as a more sort of uh, preferred solution, we will be sure to recommend that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think I suppose that will be very uh, interesting for many to know how actually this will be further yeah supported or facilitated to reach the the fairness or in the in the long run i see some rather i think more practical questions that are maybe for christina and, and maybe joy as well to answer is how did you recruit data stewards and do you have any uh yeah experience how how to become a data steward from a library professional perspective so maybe for for christina and maybe joy if you if you have anything to say about that Uh, yeah, I could probably answer more on, on the training side than uh, the recruitment, um, but certainly for the, the training, there's a lot of um, RDA groups. Um, there's EOS skills uh, working group as well, so there's quite a lot of people working to try and come up with this. Um, there's training that's being offered through a lot of the, the European Commission cluster projects as well. Um, so there's things like Elixir where they're doing specific data stewardship training for, for the life sciences. And as I mentioned, we've got the Ferris Fair um, uh, data stewardship training, which is um, something that we're piloting at the moment. But there, there's a few different options. Um, the work that I think Christina mentioned is that a lot of this is very kind of informal at the moment on the job training. Um, and there is a need to really progress this as a profession and to get some endorsement of the skills and and some some level of formal certification, but at the moment it is it's mostly through these initiatives in a, uh, an informal sort of a way. Yeah, Christina, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, maybe that uh, the, the, on the question indeed about what sort of advice that uh, I would have to library professionals who are keen on becoming data stewards. Um, I would definitely invest in these uh, technical skills. So really, uh, I don't know if you know about the library carpentry, but um, 
and it's it's a great organization that really tries to invest in the technical skills of of librarians uh, about data um, and yeah, learning about programming, learning these also very uh, technical skills. And uh, um, yeah, I'm involved in that as well, where we working on a fair data curriculum actually uh, as well. So data modeling and yeah, invest in this because this is definitely the future. And if you do that, those skills will always be uh, needed and are very much sought for. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, in many discussions that, that we have in here at UA, there's often the, the need for skilled people and the challenge to hire them to become data stewards. Also relating to, to the possibility of actually having a career in that area is definitely something that, that we hear a lot and that probably has to change a little bit more uh, on a systemic level to really make this attractive. Like let's say in, in the 40 countries or so that 48 countries that for example, EOA covers, because many of these things are also uh, embedded in the legal uh, situation about hiring different types of stuff. Now, I, I see just a very last question maybe for Costas and then we can wrap up. And there is the, the question about additional or special funds for data management in a project, if that will be maybe possible. I suppose that actual data management already can be, is eligible. So I yeah. guess the question, if there is maybe something on top uh, that could be <laughs> received from certain funds that maybe are geared towards making the data more fair or well so. it's it's very clear that all, all uh costs associated with uh data management and by extension for for data they are eligible costs so uh the 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 job of the beneficiary is to describe very well in the data management plan and in the proposal what they intend to do and uh, justify sort of why this this cost is needed for for data management and then it will be of course included in the in the cost of the project good that, that is very clear to make the proposal also uh, very clear in terms of the costs that are needed to cover yeah stuff such and as this, christina uh, to support exactly <laughs> and i go back to to both actually uh, christina and joy because indeed the data management plan uh, ideally would be a living document throughout uh, throughout the project that you can see progression and what what really happened um, throughout the lifetime of the project but also the role of, the, of a data steward will be crucial and we see more and more universities institutions uh, sort of developing these profiles and this is very encouraging because uh, we, we get sometimes the question that uh, oh I have to focus on my research I cannot do all those uh, tasks associated with data management so this is where a data steward can can also be very helpful and we need to see the prof professionalization of those roles as well and um, in the example of the European COVID-19 data platform very quickly to tell you that we had uh, a really big network of collaboration with different uh, countries. And for the example of Germany, that has a peculiarity of, of the different uh, sort of uh, lender that have uh, different laws for data sharing. And when it comes to uh, genomics health data, uh, they actually hired a full-time data steward to be able to respond and to be able to upload data to the portal. So, you know, we, we see this, uh, evolving and uh, it, it's very encouraging so we hope that we see more of these roles yeah i can as, as ua i can fully support uh support that so i i think we should wrap up here we are almost uh 10 minutes beyond the time that was indicated but i would like to really thank you uh, the speakers christina costas and joy uh, for taking the time for staying on a bit longer for answering the questions and i hope that all the participants here have also taken away some interesting information some inspiration some some news about horizon europe um, maybe i see that uh, christina is also putting her her email address in the in the thing so please if, i suppose you can contact them <laughs> if you have any questions but uh, uh, yeah, I, I think we also have, I need to show uh, one little thing that is uh, that uh, as EOA, we have also a couple of uh, new events upcoming. That is uh, in January, a thematic workshop of the Council for Doctoral Education uh, that it actually also will be dealing with data management and, and uh, artificial intelligence, I believe. So that should also be interesting for some of you who are uh, already here on this call. And there will also be something uh, later in February 
online as well uh, on learning and teaching. So we have a wide range of, of topics um, that we will address in the next month. So yeah, thank you all for, for participating. As, as again, I hope you enjoyed uh, the webinar and learned something. Check out the resources of Fair is Fair that may help you and your institution in becoming more fair uh, and we're starting to be uh, more uh, fair over time. And yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Costas, Christina, enjoy. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yep.